I am uh, very privileged to uh, be delivering the lecture under your chairmanship. I uh, am thankful and grateful to IIT Gandhinagar, as Professor Alok Kanungo for and collaborators uh, for the this very prestigious uh, you know seminar on unsettling archaeologies and. I think that uh, some of the work that I am doing for two, three months here at Ghent University is uh, somewhat similar that we are also going to have a workshop uh, next month uh, on the role of forest dwellers uh, and uh, other indigenous communities in, in ancient international exchange networks, uh, which is uh, sponsored by Professor Daniel Adi Simon here. So uh, the whole idea is, uh, I, I was fascinated with the whole idea of this uh, seminar and the workshop um, that, you know, how uh, archaeology and the ancient past can, you know, become relevant today, uh, address issues of today, uh, especially, you know, in this period of globalization. So uh, these are some of the thoughts that, you know, I'm sort of trying to get together to share with you. Uh, and uh, so uh, the uh, topic, archaeology and heritage, the idea of an Indian ocean nest. So um, basically, uh, this is uh, about uh, a lot of my work for the last more than two decades, which was began with a PhD on archaeology of Roman sea trade with India, but uh, expanded you know, to the whole idea of uh, an Indian Ocean uh, framework, uh, looking at uh, the Indian Ocean past and uh, the uh, not only trade, but exchange culture and the uh, whole of the complexity. So, um, so, so the, 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 the here, especially uh, today, uh, the, I, they say, the whole idea of what we call Indian Oceanness is a word that actually I uh, picked up from one of the declarations of uh, the academic groupings, uh, which is part of uh, IORA, or Indian Ocean Rim Association, uh, you know, the multilateral body that has been formed this uh, membership of, I think, 23 uh, member states uh, of the Indian Ocean Rim countries. And uh, in, including also, I think, uh, non-Indian Ocean countries like the USA uh, and uh, France and others. So, uh, so this is uh, something which was important when we uh, look at uh, the fact that uh, now, can we have the next slide, please? Or do I have to do it? Okay, so this is not the entire Indian Ocean, but uh, something which uh, will give you an idea. Uh, the, the, the whole concept is that, you know, uh, the Indian Ocean as a whole, uh, with its uh, many disparate cultures, communities, um, is there, but, uh, you know, even though it's disparate, even though it's diverse, there is something called uh, a panasonic not maybe a very standardized identity, but the proposal here is that, you know, I mean, if we have to have uh, something like uh, an Indian Ocean Rim Association and many other initiatives, which are now looking at Indian Ocean as maybe uh, one cultural zone, um, you know, uh, there has to be some kind of a uh, cross awareness amongst the people and communities living in the Indian Ocean countries and even worldwide that there is, a, you know, a, a common heritage, a common culture, um, common in the sense that, you know, of appreciating each other's culture. So uh, you would have a stone town in Zanzibar and, you know, the churches of Goa or uh, that is more monumental. And of course, um, I will come to the point on how archeology span can play a role. But, uh, you know, uh, this is very, uh, I thought this is very important uh, in from many points of view, which I would like to explain. And I think because this uh, kind of uh, awareness 
uh, I will not call it a common identity or try to standardize things, but a common awareness is lacking. Uh, it exists, uh, in my opinion, in some notional sense, uh, like, for instance, it is uh, something very, very welcome uh, to have uh, the IORA uh, talk about aspiring towards um, something called to achieve a kind of Indian oceanness. The term itself is something which I find very refreshing, but how do we go about it? Uh, so can we get to the next one, please? Next slide, please. Okay, so we know the electoral regions of the Indian Ocean witness prehistoric migrations, emergence of some of the greatest civilizations, Mesopotamia, Indus, uh, even I would say Egypt uh, is part of the extended Indian Ocean uh, networks because we know that the rise and fall of the river Nile and the flooding of the Nile is caused by the Indian Ocean monsoon. Uh, development of maritime technologies and spread of, spread of trade networks. The Indian Ocean region is rooted in the deep past, a rich heritage zone, which is the passageway for over 80% of the world's oil trade is one third of the planet's inhabitants. So we are looking at a very important area. And uh, next one, please. Okay, so this is uh, to give you an idea of the spread, uh, the entire Indian Ocean, the Western Ocean, you can see the Red Sea uh, and the Gulf of Aden, uh, the coast of East Africa. Of course, I should have shown the entire stretch, but I'm sorry about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, and on the eastern side, you know, uh, you can see Southeast Asia. So, so we are looking at, you know, a kind of area, so archaeologically speaking, if we take it from even late prehistory to early history and, you know, colonial periods, rich and diverse, uh, it's ports, it's, uh, you know, um, uh, so the story begins quite early in, in this area, which I should talk about. Next, please. So the Indian Ocean Rim Academic Group, a part of the 23 member state has recently called for a stronger Indian Ocean research environment for fostering a culture of Indian Oceanness, a call for social and cultural cohesion of the disparate IOR. Now, this is uh, very, you know, very uh, refreshing, very nice. And why, you know, I'm emphasizing, uh, you know, or beginning from the level of government or policy or multilateral, I think it's important, uh, the role of, uh, you know, uh, government in, 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 in bringing things together. And one of the problems today is that uh, the Indian Ocean has been... Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the political activity, you can say, or the interest of uh, powers or nation states in the Indian Ocean has been basically driven by the economic, you know, uh, attractions, the economic dimension, uh, and the security part. These are two major, you know, dimensions which, which basically dominate uh, Indian Ocean um, policy making, uh, basically whether it is uh, like uh, at the level of uh, uh, you know unilateral or multilateral. The the third major dimension, which is one of culture, even though the uh, you know the the uh, the, the ex expression for Indian Ocean is expressed is very refreshing. But uh, I think to achieve this, uh, we need. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the role of what I call public archaeology or to root a lot of this in archaeology. And this is uh, my basic, you know, submission today. Uh, because uh, if we go to the next one, please. Okay, the problem is that the concern, as I said, uh, it revolves around economics and security. The dimension of culture is not really addressed. Even if it is culture, it's mainly equated with tourism. It's very notional, which means attraction for like very visible and monumental sites like Stone Town of Zanzibar or the churches of Goa, which are, of course, part of the Indian Ocean heritage. They are part of 
uh, you know, uh, tourist attractions. Uh, but there's a notional regard for culture, which I'm saying, which has kept out a rich scientific record of Indian Ocean past from the public as well as from public policy. Now, no, no, this, uh, you know, I mean, uh, when I would trawl the website for the minutes and discussions on the entire idea of culture and Indian Oceanness and everything, uh, I find it's really like driven, as I said, by, uh, by tourism, uh, by uh, which I call a notional uh, a monumentality, visibility, and they are attractive. So people travel, but you have, you know, actually uh, not only governments, but you have a large amount of public and out of that uh, large, large number of tourists in the thousands who are uh, spending, as I said, a lot of money, not only in the Indian Ocean region, but all over the world in India, or, you know, Indian Ocean, all over the world, uh, a lot of money is being spent by ordinary people, families who are traveling to see these beautiful, you know, monuments all, you know, everywhere. So, so, so in my opinion, you know, what, what they are doing is to enjoy the monuments, but also there is a hunger for um, stories, hunger for content. Uh, there is a, a hunger to, to know, uh, you know, much more about the places they are visiting. And what I am trying to say here is this, that, you know, uh, here is where the archaeological record of the Indian Ocean comes in, because uh, you know, uh, right from the deep past, even from late prehistory onwards, it carries our research is unfortunately all recycled within, you know, academia itself. And, you know, uh, none of those, uh, because, you know, at its root, uh, even though archaeology is a, a, you know, application, a lot of earth science, a lot of scientific excavations to basically uh, uh, the bottom line is recreates the past. It recreates, it reconstructs, you know, um, uh, the, 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 act, the, the, the human record, like in its, all its diversity and all its cinematic quality. Archaeology is very attractive, which is an outdoor kind of thing. So you see, there's a lot of um, ultimately, uh, you can say stories or a lot of the rich past that is hidden, which is not, you know, coming out into the public domain, which would be uh, very good for formation of policy, uh, also good for education, like curriculum development, and definitely, you know, uh, so for instance, uh, shall we have the next one, please? So the importance of the archaeological record from this point of view, therefore, it is necessary to move out of the notional regard for culture and the attraction of monuments to access the archaeological record from at least the late prehistory and mine it for the rich stories of human endeavor. So let us see some examples. Next one, please. So, you know, I mean, uh, something which is not uh, so visible, but it is in museums, but, you know, people need to be told to know. Uh, I mean, this, of course, follows from my recent contribution to the, uh, to the archaeological record of you know the glass trade across the Indian Ocean and here is a uh, very kind courtesy of Professor Said Botham of Telava University to give me these photographs of uh, the fragments of Roman you know glassware which are found on the Egyptian Red Sea coast which we exported I and mean, this is one example how you know the uh, pillar molded bowls and you know how this glass was made the attractive colors if you see it purely from you know a storytelling point of view or something, you know, a, a public which is spending, um, you know, a family is spending a lot of money traveling to Egypt, maybe seeing the pyramids, but also would love to know about these, you know, the glasses, how they arrived on the coast and how they were traded so far. And so this is uh, important. Next, please. Another example is, of course, from these are the uh, Indo-Pacific beads from Arika Medu, and we know that they were circulating all over the Indian Ocean. And as far as Japan, we know that in the first, second century AD, and I was surprised myself when I spent my fellowship period in Japan and worked on these, that they were being imported in thousands in the Yayoi period. Uh, so this, this is a, you know, I mean, um, 
So at that time, my Japanese colleagues thought they were all coming from China and many of them didn't believe. So we worked on this, but this itself tells a huge, you know, an amazing story of, of, of long distance trade. Obviously, nobody was sailing directly from the Bay of Bengal or Southeast Asia to Japan, but you could imagine the different exchange networks that it passed through. And today, when we talk about an Indo-Pacific, you know, uh, area, uh, even in terms of how policy making uh, makers are structuring, uh, you know, these are uh, the actual, you know, archaeological records on which a lot of this uh, of cultural policy making, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, defining, you know, education uh, approaches to um, maybe, you know, uh, curriculum in universities and even for the public would be rooted in. Next, please. And of course, the ancient ports, this is uh, the, the, the ancient harbor site of Kamraj on the river Tapi, which I had the occasion to excavate uh, you know, in 2003. And it tells an amazing story of uh, export, uh, you know, basically corroborates the ancient sea guide Periplus Maris Eritri in terms of, uh, uh, you know, um, a large amount of um, iron being produced here uh, the finding of an axomite shard, uh, late Roman amphorae, uh, a lot of things on this ancient port that we reported on, but um, videos of this, uh, a lot of uh, lot of content uh, in terms of exciting, you know, exchange networks that were, you know, the adventure and the entire cinematic quality of the place, what was happening would be very attractive for, you know, for, uh, for, for visitors, for, for tourists. So uh, essentially, um, next please. Okay, so, so the routings of an Indian oceanness have to be what I'm saying in the archeological record. Uh, so we bring, need to bring out the rich archeological record of the Indian Ocean past into the public domain so that the awareness spreads about common Indian Ocean heritage and fosters a sense of an Indian Oceanness. In that sense, this will then allow the rootings of culture in a scientific foundation do away with the notional sense of culture, which prevails both at the public and policy levels. And the Indian Ocean Rim Association has to be engaged on this issue. So there are programs of wider nature that can be created. Now, you know, so this is important because, you know, today you have the security dimension, you have the big economic dimension, and there are so many, you know, uh, programs and fundings and, you know, uh, a whole lot of things happening over there. But even within the level of policymaking, I'm afraid uh, the policymakers or those who are part of this, in, in, you know, across the board, not only in Iowa, but I think uh, it would include uh, a wider, you know, public, this thing is, are basically disconnected from the rich archaeological record. And you know, to, to basically, uh, so it takes it away towards, uh, as I said, the notional culture or the monumentality and the tourism part for which we have, of course, uh, the, the kind of content and data, but, you know, all this, uh, you know, rich uh, stories hidden in the archeological record are just disconnected. That's one. Secondly, uh, even in terms of uh, articulating, let's say, uh, connections, long distance connections between communities, like there was trade, we know, you know, across the Persian Gulf. And we, we do have, you know, several seminars which address that, of course, scholars come and we do have seminars that how, you know, uh, different parts of the Indian Ocean were connected, but which are basically attended by academics. But here we are talking about, you know, how do we connect this rich record so that, you know, even in terms of articulation, let's say of, you know, a, a, diplomatically speaking, if we are talking about connections between countries in the ancient past, um, you know, uh, there could be uh, articulations which derive from, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the archaeological record, which has been proven. And so this is uh, something which uh, is important. And secondly, uh, can we move to the next one, please?
Well, I'll just continue to speak. And then uh, I think another proposal that I would like to give here is, uh, okay, maybe uh, it stopped there, uh, is also, you know, we've talked about IORA and we've talked about public policy and, you know, basically to connect things. And that would help, you know, with, uh, with the maybe formation of, uh, you know, better tourist programs and, you know, involve archeologists uh, in this whole exercise. Uh, the other thing would be, you know, that can we not, you know, uh, develop a kind of curricula for schools and universities, uh, which are, you know, of countries along the Indian Ocean Rim, so that, you know, a child growing up in Kenya would, you know, know about, uh, let's say, uh, the Indus Valley civilization or the Mesopotamian civilization as part of his growing up, not like when he goes to do research in archaeology. And, you know, uh, and, and so also, uh, you know, a child in India or other Indian Ocean countries uh, would know about, you know, the kind of um, uh, coastal port sites uh, in, in Kenya and Tanzania, which are being searched today, whether it is Manda or whether it is those uh, even earlier, you know, sites which are being, you know, investigated around Rafta in Zanzibar. So, uh, this also would create, you know, a sense of what we call Indian oceanness, a kind of cross awareness of that, you know, people living around the Indian Ocean Rim uh, shared these kind of cultures, and this is something which we could look at, you know, uh, in 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 schools, colleges, and universities in a in a in a more uh, popular way, and uh, uh, you know, this could be disseminated through the tourism network to bring. Uh, this kind of, you know, and also programs where we take them to sites and you know, explain to them, maybe those sites may not be as monumental as the others, but I'm sure, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, evidence that we tell them about would, would fascinate them. So this is, uh, you know, one, one thing. And of course, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the big initiatives, which are especially taken in India, like present a huge opportunities for, for doing this. And I think we are at the cusp of this change. And I refer to two major you know, initiatives. One is, of course, Project Mossam, which uh, you know, India has proposed to the UNESCO to culturally map the Indian Ocean. And, uh, you know, and uh, I was just going through, uh, because there's a, a seminar on this coming up in next month. Uh, and I think they are going to address this issue. And something fascinating was, you know, to the, to the effect that, you know, to bring out uh, the records and data and to connect, uh, you know, uh, the ancient networks which were there, uh, which have not been really, you know, connected before or that data has not been uh, sort of retrieved before. So there is this kind of uh, major initiative, which of course, will go a long way, I think, in creating this idea of the Indian oceanness, which is uh, through this uh, initiative of Project Mossam. And the other uh, initiative that is taking place and which will in two or three years is the uh, creation of this, uh, the, the establishment of the National Maritime Heritage Complex near the ancient Indus port of Lothal in Gujarat. And that is coming up in almost 400 you know, acres of land. And it is an amazing initiative, which will have a kind of small township. Not only will it house the, the, the Indian Maritime, the National Maritime Museum of India, which uh, is going to you know, highlight uh, even Indian you know, uh, role in, in, the Indian, in the wider Indian Ocean in the ancient past, but will also have um, uh, a lot of public areas, uh, uh, a lot of digital content uh, which will be generated. And even uh, I think it will have uh, places to stay like hotels and, uh, you know, um, research centers. So, so, so these two initiatives are uh, very, very important from the point of view of, uh, you know, uh, making, uh, you know, um, giving teeth to the idea of, uh, uh, to the cultural dimension of the Indian Ocean. So, uh, so these are some of the ideas that I wanted to share with you uh, when we talk about unsettling archaeologies, that how 
do we bring uh, the, 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 the importance of this archaeological record from late prehistory to, to modern times to be connected to these initiatives, whether it is Iora or you know, individual nation states or uh, Project Mossum or the National Maritime you know, complexes. And uh, so, uh, so, so this is uh, something uh, which uh, struck me. And how uh, do we actually, you know, today work with uh, not only communities uh, uh, and coastal communities in particular, but also with schools, with universities, and with governments in order to, you know, uh, enrich and you know spread the awareness of uh, an Indian Oceanness. So thank you very much. This is uh, some of the ideas I wanted to share with you.